Hey, <laughs> we're here. We made it. All right, we are live. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this uh, rainy, rainy Vancouver morning. We're here <laughs> in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada uh, with Jeff Cote. Morning, Jeff. How are you doing today? Good morning. Wonderful morning. Yeah, doing quite well. Happy to be here. This is our second life, so I'm pretty excited. Yeah. All right, well, let's see if we've got some questions uh, starting here. Here's Valhalla. Good morning, good morning. Uh, we have a question that we wanted to get started with. All uh, right. Jeff, should I turn my inverter off or put it in standby when I leave the uh, boat? All right, great question. Uh, first of all, uh, last week uh, or two weeks ago when we did our first live session, uh, some of you were sharing your feedback that we didn't get a chance to answer all your questions. Um, so we're going to try our best to go through the questions as efficiently as possible. And if um, you've got a question and we don't get a chance to answer it, please understand. Yesterday, last time there was way more questions than we had time. Keep your Try to keep your questions as concise as possible. Uh, that allows us... It takes less time to repeat them and it allows us to focus more on the answer than just the question. So, all right. So with that, we're going to dive right in. So an inverter. Um, inverters are complicated. If you don't think inverters are complicated, uh, just wait. Uh, there's a lot of magic that happens in an inverter. And there's this feature called standby. So standby means, listen, inverter, I want you to turn yourself on. And the inverter goes, well, actually, I know you said that you want me on, but realistically, I'm sensing AC in on the boat, either from generator or shore. And why would I turn myself on if I have an AC input on the ins on the input of the inverter? I'm just gonna let it pass through. So a lot of us don't realize, but even when we're connected to shore power, our inverters are on standby. They're just waiting. They're just letting AC go through. And so you take off, everything's fine. You're running all your loads on shore power. And then suddenly you have an outage. Uh, shore power goes out for whatever reason. Here in British Columbia, it could be a storm. It could be a neighbor that kicks a cord. It could be an accident. It happens. And then what happens with the inverter is the inverter goes on to on. Now it's not standby anymore. Now it's running all your AC loads on your boat that were on through the inverter. And the challenge with that is that sometimes those AC loads are pretty significant and they'll drain your batteries relatively quickly. So my advice is that when we're connected to shore power and we're away from our boats, we should always disable the inverter, not the charger, disable the inverter so that if, in the event that you lose shore power, you're not gonna have your batteries completely be drained. So make sure that if you have an inverter charger, that you disable the inverter function when you're connected to shore power so that your inverter does not turn on when you're not on board and power all those AC loads from batteries. So that's a good question. All right, Missy. All right, we have another question here from Leo. I have four golf cart flooded lead acid batteries and I'd like to change them out to Firefly carbon foam batteries. Mm. If I do, will the amp power be the same or better? I have a 40 amp charger and 330 watts of solar. We love uh, to be at anchor. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna just wondering, uh, provide feedback if uh, everyone's uh, hearing uh, Melissa repeat or say say out loud the question in case I don't have to say them. Uh, but Leo here was having a question of four golf cart batteries on board, thinking of going to Firefly as um, <clears throat> a 40 amp charger and 330 watts of solar, okay? So that's sort of the context. And the question was, well, how many amp hours am I gonna go if I will go for Firefly? Well, first thing is that in the footprint of four golf cart batteries, you can realis realistically put about three group 31s just because of the format ratio. Uh, but in terms of amp hours to amp hours, if you go nominal to nominal, so just the rated capacity of the battery, golf cart batteries are generally around 220, 240 amp hours at six volt. And this is important. You need two of those batteries to make a 12 volt, 220 or 240 amp hour battery. And then you take those two and you put them in parallel with another two batteries and so that brings you to basically 440 amp hours at 12. Four batteries for 400 amp hours, 440. Fireflies, the group 31s are uh, 110. So you would also need four of those to have nominal to nominal. But the reality is, and the advantage with a Firefly battery like lithium, is your ability to go deeper on the depth of discharge, right? So that means that you don't need as much batteries to begin with 
because you can go deeper on the bank. So generally, like on my boat, I had, for example, eight golf cart batteries, and I replaced the eight golf cart with six Group 31 batteries. Now, here's the challenge. Um, Fireflies want to be charged at a minimum charge rate of 20% of capacity. So in your instance, you know, you've got now 330 amp hours of Firefly capacity. Let's say you do three. Uh, you would need a charge rate of at least 66 amps. So that means that most likely you're going to be getting an inverter charger that has maybe an 80 amp charger or get a larger charger. But it's really essential that you charge those Firefly batteries at a minimum of 20%. So that's the, that's the trick. So you can get away with less Fireflies which is good, right? Because they have deeper depth of discharge, but but they need a fast charge rate, 20%. So good question. Thanks for asking. And thanks everyone you can hear. We have a better sound system today. So <laughs> we fix that. <laughs> Thank well you done. For your feedback. <laughs> All right, awesome. All right, question from Jonathan. What is the best place to mount the sensor for a gas detector? In the bilge below the floorboards or just above? Mm. Yeah. Well, it depends what kind of gas, right? So some gas are denser than air and some gas are lighter than air. So for example, I'm not sure in the question if it's for propane. For propane uh, systems, what we end up doing, you're right, the sensor actually goes low because that's the challenge with propane is it's actually heavier than air. That's why we don't have propane in homes. Uh, it would fill a basement or it would fill a boat. So lowest point is definitely, but not so low that you're going to have moisture, right? Or you're going to accidentally have it get wet in the bilge. Low enough, but not too low. So for example, my boat, I'll have a propane detector uh, beneath the oven. So if ever there's too much uh, propane that is not being used or leaking, it's going to catch it there. And then I put the other propane detector sensor uh, near the bilge, but not in the bilge. So I don't expect it ever to get wet. For carbon monoxide, it doesn't matter. It can be, you know, at could be at chest level. It could be anywhere because remember, carbon carbon dioxide and monoxide they rise, so that's not an issue. So they don't have to be low. And for gasoline fumes, same thing. So if you're doing for a gasoline detector in the engine room, you don't have to have it low. It's only for propane. Yeah. All right. Next question up is from Charlie. Jeff, I have a lithium battery for a starting battery. Can I connect a DC to DC charger to the battery isolator to regulate the amperage and not damage the alternator? Mm. Okay. All right. That's a tough one. Uh, so we've got an alternator. A battery isolator is a, a device that shares an alternator charge to multiple batteries. A DC to DC device is something that goes battery to battery. So we're really talking about two separate things, as you're probably mentioning. But the DC to DC is not going to go back to the battery isolator. The DC to DC is between batteries. The alternator is from maybe a little bit higher up, hits the battery isolator, and then sends it to both batteries. The DC to DC charging converter actually goes battery to battery. So your alternator would be regulated from an external regulator if you wanted to have a sophisticated charge curve, right? So probably, you know, you can have a ball mar or anything else, um, and you're going to be outputting three-stage charging from the alternator to the battery isolator, battery isolator to both of your lithium battery banks. And to go from different battery banks, then you're going to go DC to DC charging converter. But you don't need to connect the DC to DC charging converter back to the battery isolator. It's battery to battery. Yeah. All right. Another battery question from Julian. All right. Jeff, I have an AGM battery as a start battery and four flooded house batteries. My ACR knowing a drawdown with two types of batteries? Mm. So I'm not, I'm not too sure about that question. Um, so ACR is a marketing word. It's just a name that they gave. It's, it's from Blue Seas. So there's different words to describe the same thing, right? Um, so battery combiner is, uh, it could be called a VSR, voltage sense relay. It could be called an ACR, automatic combiner relay. Ultimately, they're digital uh, relays. And what they simply do, they don't modify voltage. They don't do any of that stuff. They just simply, it's effectively like putting your two batteries in parallel. And why it's better than a battery switch is it connects and disconnects your batteries whenever there's a charging voltage or not. So in times of plenty, if you have a charging voltage on one battery and the other battery doesn't have it, the battery combiner, in this case an ACR, will allow current 
to flow to the other battery to also rise it. So that's how you basically charge, share a charging voltage from one battery to the other is via an ACR or a battery combiner. And um, yeah, that's basically how it works, but it does not modify voltage. It does not. So if one battery wants, has a different chemistry or wants a different charge profile, the battery combiner is not sophisticated. It just puts the batteries in parallel. If you want something sophisticated, you want a DC to DC charging converter. Okay, this question also on batteries from Triangle Mountain Motors. He's looking for an opinion. Okay. Uh, while we're talking about batteries, I'm about to buy two Optima D34Ms, okay. one for starting and one for the house loads. Is that a good choice? Yeah, um, Optima is uh, a really compact battery that offers a big punch. Um, they're not, we don't have too many in our geographic area. Certainly they're very popular. Uh, a lot of boats come with them, especially they've got high density, right? So for their format and what they give you, their rated amp hours or capacity is really, really good. Um, having a starter battery and having a house battery from Optima is doable. Generally for us, we would probably have, you know, like uh, batteries like Rolls, North Star, Firefly. Uh, those would probably our go-to, but those are ge geographical sort of differences. I almost said it. Um, and it's not to say that it's a bad way to do it is I don't have that much experience with the Optima batteries. I see them, they're really popular, uh, but we don't have that many uh, in our market here in British Columbia, Vancouver. Yeah. All right. I have a question from Doug and I'm not sure if we've ever had this before. Uh, howdy from Victoria. I have a 34 foot Fairliner sedan cruiser. I wonder how I calculate if adding three quarter inch plywood subfloor is too much weight. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's more structural than electrical. <laughs> hey, listen, I know a little bit about a tiny little subject, and that's electrical. Uh, on that, for the floors, that's totally structural, and it's out of my wheelhouse. Um, I don't, I don't, I can't help everyone about everything on a boat. I can help a little bit on electrical and electronics, but on that topic, I have no idea. Don't know. Um, I would ask probably some somebody else. <laughs> Yeah, that's not for me. All right, Scooter Daddy says, best Saturday ever. Hey! <laughs> and we have another, another opinion from Jeff. All I'm right. Debating between Symarine Pico, Victron, and M2 monitors, is Symarine Pico in the same league? Yeah, Symarine is, um, it's actually pretty amazing. Um, again, pretty rare. Not many people are willing to jump to that level. Uh, but I've heard really, really good things. We rarely install it, uh, that product line, but that's not to say I don't believe in it. Um, some of my colleagues in the industry, um, you know, in various parts of the world are promoting that product and are really big believers. And by association, I would say if they're into it, then I'm into it here. Here in the Pacific Northwest, um, most of us are probably choosing Victron uh, for battery monitors. Um, and then Blue Seas makes a really good one too, the State of Charge, the M2, really good. I like it. Um, and then Victron obviously has the Color GX, has all these different, the Serbo now, so and the Touch 50. So all possible with Victron. And Xantrax also makes good battery monitors. But Cymarine is actually really good. It's, 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 I would say it's probably a notch above or equal to the Touch from Victron in terms of capabilities, yeah. All right, here's a good question from Valhalla. Everyone wants your opinion today, Jeff. <laughs> Valhalla, All right, why not? Let's do it. I'm getting ready to replace my old batteries with Fireflies, but I want to replace my inverter charger. Mm. Do you have a recommendation? Yeah, so if you're going to, so, okay, good question. So you're changing your batteries to Firefly, and what's my recommendations for inverter chargers? So my go-to for inverter chargers are probably gonna be Victron, it's probably gonna be right at the top. Magnum also makes great inverter chargers, great. Uh, Mastervolt as well is a really good company. So there's Mastervolt, there's Victron, um, Magnum is a good one, Xantrax as well. It all depends on your sort of budget, right? Uh, Mastervolt is generally the most expensive. Victron is sort of right in the fray with uh, Xantrax. Magnum is a, maybe a little bit more than that. What I recommend is if you've never heard of a brand before and you're about to buy that inverter, really just question yourself before you do that. There's a lot of no-name inverters out there. And it's not to say they're not bad, 
The question is, do you want to be an adopter and find out that it's bad, right? So the most valuable thing that we have is time. And so what I'm always suggesting is don't take chances on your boat. Go with proven and true uh, because we're all out in the water to enjoy it. And as fun as it is to do projects, we don't want to do projects forever. So you want to do a project and then it's behind us and then we move on to another project. So I would go with one of the reputable manufacturers I talked about. And by the way, on my boat, um, I have a Victron. So I have a Victron Multi Plus 3000 watt, 120 amps uh, inverter charger. All right, Roger would like to know, why do you need a minimum charge rate? Doesn't it just take longer to charge? Yeah, that's a great question, Roger. I know, that's what I thought too, right? I was like, oh, it just takes longer. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not like a pool analogy where you just fill the hose and if it takes a year to fill the pool, it takes a year or it takes a day, it doesn't matter. Battery is, is this uh, device that these plates actually, you're trying to re-energize all of these battery plates. And think about these battery plates, for you to be able to re-energize all of it, you need pressure, right? And if you do it, let's say at a fraction of the right charge rate, you're only going to re-energize, let's say, 99% of the battery. To you and I, hey, 99%, what's, you know, if your calorie intake recommended is 2,000 and you have 1,950, what's the big deal? First day, no problem. Second day, no problem. But over time, you would actually be in a state of actually where you're going to atrophy and it's going to have serious impact. So what happens is when we charge our batteries at a even 1% less than they need, the next time you charge it, it's you're charging 99% of 99%. I can assure you this. Every single boat manufacturer I've ever been on has matched, and I mean, not everyone, but like 99.999%. I'm talking every builder. They could be German. They could be French. They could be British. They could be Dutch. They could be Australian, American, Canadian. All of them are going to have this minimum charge rate for flooded lead acid batteries of 10% of capacity as a function of charge rate. And you do that for deep cycle. So engine batteries are different, but for deep cycle, it's 10%. That's minimum. That's not maximum. And for Firefly, that minimum is 20%. And if you don't do that, the batteries will sulfate over time and you'll have a shorter life. So I know it's hard to believe, but trust me, after 15 years in the business, I can tell you that I've seen a lot of pain and uh, pain is, a, you want to avoid it. And the best way to avoid pain, changing your batteries prematurely is to charge them at the right rate of charge. So it's counterintuitive, but it's true. All right, well, we're gonna switch gears a little bit here. Ron would like to know, what do I need to use an iPad for a chart plotter? Oh, hi, Ron. Yeah, so um, there's a lot of good apps out there, right? Um, Garmin uh, basically bought Navionics. Navionics has an app that's pretty cool, very good, uh, easy to use. It's not too sophisticated, not a lot of integration play, right? Uh, it's standalone. Um, what I've heard a lot of boaters use is iNavX. So uh, that's really popular. And you can actually start integrating different sensors over Wi-Fi to be seen on your chart on your iPad or tablet. So you'd actually be able to see, for example, AIS information that's relayed over Wi-Fi to the tablet. So iNavX seems to be a good one. If any other boaters, by the way, like this is not, you know, I, I know some things, but I don't know all things. And so if any of you are sharing or have a good uh, sort of story about the app that you're using on your tablet or on your Android or iPhone, I mean, iPad, please talk about it down below and uh, share with us which app is best for you for navigation. Yeah. All right. Here's an adventurous soul. He says, I'm thinking of sailing across oceans. My boat sails at six knots average. Mm. Along with the solar, I was thinking about a wind generator or hydro generator. Mm -hmm. What do you recommend? Yeah, good question. Most people do both. Um, you know, it depends. If you're not going to do a lot of passage making, then go for a wind. But if you're going to be doing a lot of passage making where your loads are higher, remember, remember, there's really, when you're looking at a profile for a boat, there's two sort of different profiles. Well, there's three, but we only talk about two. One is what happens when I'm at anchor and what happens when I'm underway. And the underway loads are much higher because you're running autopilot, potentially radar, you're running AIS, you're running nav lights, right? You're running a lot more gear when you're underway. And so your loads are higher than when you're at anchor. So a lot of people will have a tow gen 
so that basically when they're actually sailing underway, they've, they're able to supplement all the power requirements of going underway. And a wind turbine makes sense in a lot of places, especially where in British Columbia, it's harder to justify. Not to say it doesn't work, but here the trees are giants. You know, they're 300 feet, 200 feet. This is like 100 meter trees are, you know, everywhere. It's crazy. So our anchorages are relatively very compact and we don't have a lot of wind in our anchorages most of the time. But for example, in the Caribbean, uh, I've seen tons of wind generators there that are actually relatively quiet. And um, if I was cruising offshore, I would for sure do for sure wind first. And then if I had a little bit more money left over, I would probably do a tow gen as well. I do both. Yeah. All right, we're going to stick with electronics. We have a question from Ian. He says, I'm about to install an AIS. Oh, it's the M-Track B400. Okay. The installation manual states that a ground is required. Is this just connected back to a negative? Mm. Oh, are we going down the rapid hole with grounds, people? <laughs> I know there's some of you that are going to stick around forever and other people are going to run for the doors. Ground is this sort of mysterious thing that people blame for everything. It's like the boogeyman. Uh, it's it's used for every single time something is wrong in a boat. They're like, oh, it must be the ground. It must be the boogeyman. Um, it's overused. It's misrepresented. It's it's one of these sort of magical words that even people that are non-technical tell me all the time. You know, they're like, oh yeah, it's it's a grounding issue. I'm like, what do you mean by that? Oh, it's a grounding issue. They don't even know it's sort of like it's an issue, and they put the word grounding, and it makes them sound like they know more than they do. So, grounding is hard. So first of all, that's why we can all sort of just blame anything to grounding. Grounding is important and there's a difference between grounding and also it's like current carrying and non-current carrying. So some of our connections on boats, we expect current to go through that circuit. That makes sense. Um, and that would be the positive and negative on a DC circuit. Now, the RF ground or the grounding on the device is a separate path that is not supposed to have any current. And that means that the voltage is at the same at both points. Because when you start drawing current, what happens is the, there's a voltage differential between two points. So a non-current carrying ground connection is essential to keep everything at same potential. And so your grounding connection should be on a bus bar somewhere on a boat and everything that is grounding goes to that point. And from that point, there's a single and only one connection to your DC negative. I'm gonna eventually do an hour or two hour long video on grounds for some of you that wanna geek out. It's a pretty long one, I'm still working on it. Uh, but yes, you definitely wanna connect it, it's not a gimmick. And I know it might work without it, but it's gonna work a lot better with a ground. So definitely do it, definitely put a ground. All right, we have a question here from Jonathan and we have a couple of responses from some other people. So let's get Jeff's opinion. All right. I see says, I have a Victron charger with three outputs. Can I charge both the flooded starter battery and a lithium battery, or will the lithium profile not charge the flooded starter correctly? Mm. Oh, that's a tough one. First of all, compromise, 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 compromise. There is no such thing as a perfect solution on a boat. A battery charger with three outputs is effectively replicating the same thing on multiple outputs. They're isolated, they can't communicate, they're not connected with one another, but you gotta choose one profile. So generally you avoid doing this setup. You would have maybe your Victron three battery bank charger focus on the lithium, and then the lithium battery would share a charge via DC to DC char charging converters to the other one so that each battery gets the right charge voltage that they require. So no, you would not, you're not supposed to connect a lithium and two AGM batteries to a single charger. And if you did that, uh, the AGMs would be chronically undercharged and would die prematurely. Uh, because lithium has a lower charge voltage, so AGM wants higher, and so you're constantly underfeeding the battery, and so those batteries would die prematurely. So that's why you wouldn't do that. All right, I want to shout out to uh, Stefan from Germany. Uh, we have also wow. uh, someone here from Patagonia. That's awesome. And Thunder Bay. <laughs> By the way, Thunder Bay is in Ontario. I've never been to Patagonia. I've dreamt about it. That looks just awesome. Awesome. We have a question here from Charlie. 
Thanks for your suggestion about the Balmar alternator regulator. Mm. But I have an outboard motor. Any thoughts on how to use a lithium battery for a starting battery? Yeah, we, you know what, that's that's a answer, a question I don't really have the answer to. Um, we've never used lithium for a starting application. I'm not saying it's the wrong thing to do. We just haven't. Uh, we'll generally, in a lithium boat, we're we're generally going to run the thrusters and let's say uh, the starter battery on AGM. And then we're going to have the house on lithium and we're going to share charging voltages via DC to DC charging converters. So we'll have an alternator uh, go through a battery isolator to multiple battery banks. Yes, uh, we'll charge, we'll chronically undercharge those batteries from the alternator. We're choosing that on purpose so that we don't overcharge the lithium. And then what we'll do is we'll get the AGM batteries back to what they need to via either separate charger for those batteries, DC to DC charging converters, or solar that charges those batteries. So definitely two charging. So I've never done lithium for charging and uh, for engine start, and I've never done lithium for a windless or a thruster battery either. Yeah. All right. This is a good question from Hippie Baker. Where do you think the best location for a diesel air heater would be? Can it go in a gasoline engine or should it be in the cabin? Oh, good question. Yeah. First of all, nothing is easy. <laughs> uh, no, you cannot install a air diesel hair blower, like for example, either S bar or Webasto, uh, forced air heater in a gasoline engine room. No go, no go. You can't put even, even a normal heating system, like for example, maybe even the hydronic systems, again, from S bar or even Hurricane. Can't put those in a gasoline engine room. So the challenge is you need to put those in the cabin, but most of the time heaters are going to be installed in the aft of the boat, in lazarettes, or in a, in a power boat in the engine room, or aft of the engine room in a lazarette. So it's really tricky and almost, I find, really hard, quasi-impossible to install a heating system on a gasoline boat without... Everything's doable, but it's going to take a lot more challenge. It's going to be a lot more challenging because you cannot have any any a gasoline fumes or vapor ever, ever, ever reach that heater under no circumstances. Otherwise, it would be kaboom. So yeah, it's tough. It's really tough. We've never done it, to be honest. I've tried and I just couldn't find a way. So maybe you're going to be the lucky one. <laughs> Share your experience if you pull it off. But yeah, we've never found a way of pull, doing it. All right. We have a little follow-up, I think, to the wood floor question he okay. says sorry i asked because this is from doug yeah. i'm thinking of putting radiant in-floor heating in the boat is that a good idea yeah i don't i've never so for heating um to be honest i've never heard of anyone having radiant heating on a boat but that's not to say it hasn't been done of course it must have been done everything is possible right you just have to just do it um most people here in british columbia or in the pacific northwest are actually going to run hydronic heating and the you're basically effectively running coolant throughout the boat in a long loop or loops. And um, yeah, I've never seen actually a, a warm floor on a boat. Probably be doable. I just don't know. Don't have any advice. Never done it or have ne I've never seen it either. So you'd be probably the first for me. Yeah. yeah. Here's another. We have a couple questions about electric. So let's start with this one. Uh, from Mark, do you have any recommendations with electric motors? Because I'm looking at upgrading a trolling motor to something with actual power, like an ocean volt or e-propulsion. Any thoughts? Yeah, it's so personal, that question. You know, uh, ocean volt is a great company, by the way. Um, great company. Um, so most of the time we get involved because we are not, you know, mechanical. Uh, we get involved after someone has chosen the uh, the electrical propulsion system. They'll come to us and they'll say, okay, now I need batteries or how am I going to recharge my batteries? So we generally, most people end up choosing the propulsion system and then including us in actually making it happen. Um, it really, a lot of people are really budget conscious. It's It can get quite expensive. It can be way more than even uh, a typical diesel engine. So... The challenge is expectations versus reality. And so a lot of people start that project and eventually go overwhelmed. And so many, many boaters are having a hard time paying two, three, four, five times the amount that their typical uh, engine would have cost. 
And so they're looking for alternatives. Um, so we don't represent any brands. Um, I don't never been trained. So I don't really, to be honest, it's not a subject that I know really that well. Um, I just know that we haven't encountered a lot of problems with various different makes. How about that? So our boaters that have us on board to do the electrical portion of the electrical propulsion system uh, are all happy with their choices. The biggest choice in those situations is the battery bank and making sure it's properly sized for what you want to accomplish for range. Uh, but that's about it. So do your homework. There's a lot of choice, huge difference in prices. And honestly, most likely your budget is going to decide uh, what you're going to be able to tolerate. Because when you add it all up, it's a lot more money than most of us ever think it is. Yeah. All right. The part two of this electric question was uh, for a sailboat. He's thinking of replacing an atomic four. Mm, gasoline engine. Yeah. Yeah. So again, I, I wouldn't know. You'd have to, there's so many different companies. We're not, because I'm not a mechanical person. You know, it's not like we have engines and we worry about that and we don't understand thrust. All those things are a world onto itself. And I know it's coming together, but it's not like something that we do every day. So it's a valid question. I wish I had the answer. I just don't. I really don't. Don't know. Yeah. All right. Franklin's going to take us back to battery land. All right, he Franklin. asked, for flooded lead acid batteries, what is the maximum discharge rate for a 220 amp hour battery bank? Mm, okay, good question. So first of all, battery capacity is not fixed. So if you buy a battery that actually says 220 amp hours, it's 220 amp hours is half of the equation. It's 220 amp hours if you divide that battery or discharge that battery over a 20 hour period. So that means that it's about, let's call it about 11 amps. So you're going to, if you take a perfect battery and it's 220 amp hours, to get that, you would have to discharge it no more over a 20 hour period. So if you try to discharge it faster than that and you're discharging at 20 amps, right? You're not going to have 10 hours of runtime. You might only have seven or eight hours of runtime. And if you discharge it at 40 amps, you wouldn't be 220 divided by 40 equals five hours. Nope. It would actually be maybe only two hours. And if you had a 200 amp load on a 220 amp battery, you're not even going to have an hour. You're not even going to have half an hour. You're not even going to have probably 15 minutes. So the proportionality of the load on the battery is really important, and that's called C20 rating, capacity over 20 hours, capacity over 10 hours, C10, capacity over 5, C5. And so if you have a 220 amp hour battery, it's actually most likely called a C20 rating, and you should not discharge that battery more than about 10 amps per hour to achieve capacity of 220. So when we're sizing battery banks, I'm always thinking, okay, what is going to be proportionally the load on this battery bank? Because I don't want to load it more than its C20 rating because then I'm actually not providing the capacity that we thought we were going to provide. So I always make sure that my loads are on average less than the C20 rating of the battery so that we actually have more batteries than what it's rated for. All right. We're going to take a little social bounce here. Jonathan wants to know, what could you recommend a budget-friendly outdoor Wi-Fi antenna? Um, yeah, so that would be probably Wave Wi-Fi. Wave Wi-Fi, I believe, is out of Florida. Um, they have a pretty wide selection. They've got, I think, four or five models. We generally install the dual-band one. Um, in American, it's probably, I don't know, because I've got to think in Canadian prices, because we're in Canada, and Canadian prices are not the same as American prices. Um, they're probably about 400 and maybe 450 entry level sort of uh, Wi-Fi extender. They're probably the biggest player in the industry uh, right now. Uh, and we install a lot. Uh, but remember, Wi-Fi extenders, um, this, is, this, is, this is key. And I get boat owners that get really disappointed um, with Wi-Fi extenders. So you now have on your boat and on your laptop an amazing connection. You're five bars. You're like, this is it. Perfect. I'm set but not realizing that you can actually literally have a perfect Wi-Fi connection and have no internet. Internet and Wi-Fi are actually not related. They're completely different. One is a local area network. It's like an on-ramp going to a highway. You can have an on-ramp going on a highway, but if there's no highway, you still can't take off. So it's local. 
the Wi-Fi, and if for whatever reason the marina or wherever the service provider is that's offering that Wi-Fi signal, if it's free, it's generally going to be overused. And so you could have five bars to a Wi-Fi, and you could actually have terrible internet. So it's really a two-part solution. One is having good Wi-Fi, and then making sure and hoping that the gateway to the internet is not overused. So just be realistic with Wi-Fi extenders. Uh, they're not a, they don't provide miracles. It does work, absolutely. But if the gateway is overloaded or overused by other boaters or other whoever, other users, uh, you might have a really terrible sort of experience and it has nothing to do with Wave Wi-Fi. They did what they could. It's just they don't own all the solution. They're not an internet provider. They're just a local area sort of provider. All right, Jeff, I have a question from Skagit, and I believe I asked you this question last summer about my be beloved Bayliner. He asks, would there be a benefit to upgrading a 15-year-old Freedom 2000 inverter charger? Absolutely, 100%. <laughs> so nothing wrong with that inverter, but things have changed. It'd be like having a flip phone and wondering if an iPhone or a smartphone is better. Um, the Freedom... Inverter line are great. There's still thousands out there, even in our local market. They're modified sine wave inverters. They're highly inefficient. So when they're converting DC to AC, they're very inefficient. So you've got a higher cost, much higher cost. Um, so that's one issue. Modified sine wave means that it's a square wave. So most inductive loads are going to have a really hard time running on inductive loads. So that's another reason. And the other thing, too, is that it's not programmable for all these new sort of charge profiles that are possible. So more modern inverter chargers, you can actually go in a, what's called a custom setting and you can actually give it exactly the battery what it wants in terms of a bulk voltage, absorption voltage, and float voltage. So, and remember, an inverter is a pretty sophisticated piece of equipment. It's a computer, really. I mean, it's full, full on electronics. This is not a hammer. It's not a saw. And how many of us have 15-year-old electronics in a marine environment and expect them to have a much longer life. I would say that that's wishful thinking, right? It's like being 100 and not having a will. At one point, you've got to think that there's going to be an end to this journey. And you better do it on your own terms because these inverter chargers, they never fail at the dock when you're not using their boat. They fail actually when we're using our boats. And that generally means in the summer when everyone's out on the water, everyone's too busy, all the trades are overwhelmed, and you could have significant downtime uh, when your inverter fails. So I would consider doing a, pre a change before it fails for all the benefits that I outlined, and you won't regret it. Yeah. All right, look at this, Fiona from England. Hey, Fiona. I'm finding it difficult to understand the difference between the need for a battery combiner and a battery isolator. Mm. Is it either or both? Yeah, good question. It can actually be both. They're separate. They're not, they're not the same. So battery isolators are strictly, and I'm not saying that's not the only use, but that's like 99% of the use is to share an alternator charge. So a lot of us will have, even if you have two engines, you know, people, that, boaters that have two engines might have more than two battery banks. How do you have two income streams go to more than two places? And let's go back to just one, en one engine, one engine, one alternator. How do you have one alternator go to an engine battery, a house battery? Or what about an engine, house, and a thruster battery? Or engine, house, thruster, thruster battery? It's very, it's not common to have four battery banks on even on a sailboat. So how you do that is the uh, battery isolator. And so to share an alternator, I'm a big fan of a battery isolator. And I, I, I recommend that because it avoids nuisance tripping. Uh, so there's no surprises. So that's the reason why I recommend battery isolators for alternators. But there's also maybe alternators are not the only way to recharge a battery. Some of us recharge batteries via inverter chargers, battery chargers, solar. So how do you ch share all those other, those charging sources with other batteries? And so you might do that with battery combiners or DC to DC charging converters. So in some situations, even on brand new designs, we'll actually have both a battery isolator and a battery combiner, both install, both doing separate things, but both useful. So it is possible to have both. Yeah. All right, Autumn has a follow-up question. Does the 10% minimum charging amperage apply to lithium? 
No, lithium, uh, there is no, lithium is a completely different animal. It, it, it's sort of, honestly, it's, it's, it, there's batteries and then there's lithium. So everything that, you know, the whole, everything, when we talk about batteries, it's lead acid batteries. And that is either flooded, uh, seal valve regulated gel or seal valve regulated AGM, which stands for absorbed glass matte battery. That's pretty much when we talk about batteries without the word lithium, that's what we're talking about. It's sort of the default. It's 99% of the market. It's obviously eroding over time, but it's 99% of the market. With lithium, you know, they can take three times of capacity, but there doesn't need to be a minimum. Uh, it depends, obviously, I don't know all the manufacturer's requirements because there's a lot of them, uh, but no, it's not the same as at all like flooded lead acid. So it's much simpler that way. But also remember, lithium can also take a much higher charge rate, which is actually a good thing. So um, it means that you can, assuming that you have high chargers or high output chargers, you can actually reduce the amount of time it takes you to recharge a battery. A battery. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, can you tell us something about the pros and cons of equalization for lead acid batteries? Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. Really? Are we going to go down that rabbit hole? <sighs> yeah, equalization is tough. It's not that it's not great. It's great. It, what the, what everyone why they recommend it makes sense. The problem is actually doing it. So equalization is something that we do for lead acid batteries, specifically flooded. Some manufacturers recommend it as well for AGM. That I'm not too sure about. I'm a little bit hesitant. But for flooded lead acid battery, absolutely. It's recommended. And it sounds great. And you know what? On paper, I would do it too. The problem is execution. When you're doing an equalization charge, your voltage might go to 15, 16 at the 16 volts, I mean, on a 12 volt battery. And so what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to actually make sure that all your loads are disconnected from the battery. Oh, you're like, oh, okay, fine. I'll just turn my battery switch off. All the loads are disconnected. Well, in actuality, a lot of us have loads that are directly connected to the unswitched distribution and they bypass the battery switch. So now you've got to start worrying, okay, what all those loads, so you've got to make sure that nothing is left on the battery other than the charger. That's hard. Just that in itself is hard. And you have no more lights on the boat. You can't run a water pump. You can't do anything. Now you're going to turn on the charger. You're going to bring the voltage really, really high. And now you're supposed to be monitoring every cell. And now they're cracking. They're venting. I mean, it smells like rotten eggs. You've got to have safety gear on. You're topping off the batteries with distilled water. You're making sure that all the batteries get to a specific gravity. And you're doing that. And that might take you two, three, four, five hours while you're on board and you've got no power on board, all your loads are disconnected, and you're venting all this gas. And I'm thinking, God, I love money, but I don't love money that much. Um, so I never did it on my boat. I, I just didn't, I, I couldn't. Now that to say, I have the option, I'm not using my batteries as hard as some boaters that are offshore using their batteries every day. You hear about people offshore actually equalizing every month. Once you get used to the rigmarole, it's easy to repeat. But for most of us that haven't done it once, it's maybe a little bit more intimating or to us, uh, and it's not as straightforward as it seems to actually do it in practice. If the batteries ideally could be taken off the boat and brought to you know a bench, a barn, somewhere away from the boat, yeah, totally makes sense, easy. But to equalize on a boat, it certainly gets done. I just have never had the courage to do it. So if any of you have suggestions or experience doing equalization on your boat, please talk about it in the chat. I personally haven't done it, but I know it's definitely out there. So it's just not easy. That's all. All right. Welcome from Spain. Thank you for joining us. Hi. Uh, Mark has a rabbit hole question we're not going to answer today, but he did enjoy the Honda generator video that we did last week and wants a long version. So <laughs> Buenos dias, Mark. <laughs> I lived in Spain when I was a kid for a year. Loved it. I was in Cantabria, Santander. It was amazing. Uh, Mark's not from Spain. Oh, okay. But his question was right below Spain. All right. All right. There you go. <laughs> but we do have a good question from Will, and we have a couple more because this is also a deep dive topic. Okay. Will wants to know, is bonding the same as grounding? Mm. It is, in part. Yeah. So bonding is something that we do uh, to connect all underwater metals so that they're all at the same hull potential. So these are sort of these copper straps that you see on a boat. 
uh, these green wires that go to all the through holes on a boat. And some boats have honestly 15 underwater metal connection points, all the through hauls, the engines, it's pretty extensive. And so that's a bonding system. So the bonding system is a way for everything on the boat to be connected together. Now, how that is connected to the DC side or the grounding system. So on a boat, again, on ground, there's supposed to be a common connection point where all things are grounded, right? Kept at water haul potential. So yes, they're used interchangeably, the concept of grounding and bonding, uh, but grounding affects more than just bonding. So you could be grounding your batteries. That's another thing, right? So the DC negative is not zero volts unless it's grounded, right? Batteries are, it's all about a voltage differential, right? If you have a battery on a table and you measure from one post to the other, you're measuring a voltage differential. That battery is not at zero volts. It's only at zero volts if it's connected to ground. So we're grounding multiple things on a boat where RF is grounded, bonding is grounded, DC negative is grounding, AC grounding, right? So multiple parts of our boat need to be grounded and that includes bonding. So I guess the way to describe it is bonding is grounding, but grounding is not only bonding. So grounding affects multiple parts of our boat and bonding is one of them. Yeah. Crazy, right? Oh, I don't know if I made a lot of sense with that explanation. I think it's so hard to explain. Uh, we got 15, 20 minutes left. All right. So let's get another question here. From Leo, I'm rewiring and I'm in the design phase. Would you have multiple bus bars, for example, positive switch and unswitch, as well as negative? Would you have them at one location to limit the run of large cables? Yeah. Well, first of all, Thank you for uh, using the right terminology. And uh, yes, absolutely, you're right. The grounding, the, so when you have a battery, you, we're, we're trying to avoid having too many connections on a battery, first of all, right? Like we don't want our battery to look intimidating. And we don't want a battery to be a place where you have, and I've seen it, 15 positive connections, 10 negative connections, and you look at it and it looks like, oh my God, what is this thing, right? So a battery should be a source of power for an ability to store power, right? Give power back, but it shouldn't be a place where you bring all your connections to. So what you do is you divide connections that should be always on, unswitched, and connections that could be turned on, right? Switched. And those sh should be relatively close to the battery. And then the DC negative is obviously common to both switched and unswitched distribution. So yeah, keep it close. Um, it doesn't have to be far away. Generally, it's probably five feet, 10 feet, you know, a meter, two meters, three meters. It can be further. Of course, there's always exceptions, all the rules, but there's no reason why you should have it further than it needs to be. Ideally, it's as close as possible to the battery bank as possible because it means that your cabling can be smaller and effectively you're not going to have voltage drop, right? So you're trying to minimize voltage drop and the way to do that is to shorten the cables. And so keep the switched and on switch distribution and the negative distribution as close to a battery bank as possible. Yeah. All right. Keith wants to know, will a battery isolator work with both a 12 volt bank and a 24 or 36 volt bank? Yeah, no, no. Battery isolators are, it's like a Y valve. It, it does not modulate voltage. It st stops batteries from seeing one another, but it does not change the voltage. To change the voltage to go from a 12 to a 24, you would have the alternator. Let's say it's a let's say it's a 12 volt engine. So that means a 12 volt starter, 12 volt alternator. You're going to have a 12 volt starter battery, no problem. Then what you want to do if you want to recharge, for example, a thruster battery bank, uh, or I don't know, it could be a windless bank that's 24 volts, whatever it is, or even electrical propulsion that's 48 volts. What you're going to have is a DC to DC charging converter that will recharge that battery at a higher voltage. So battery isolators are completely separate and do not alter voltage. It just shares it. So good question, commonly asked. And I'm sorry, it's so confusing, but it's just one of those things. If it was easy, I wouldn't be here anyway. So <laughs> welcome to the club. Marine electrical is not easy. No. So from electrical, we're gonna switch to electronics. Okay. Pete Ross is in Hilton Head. 
I he has a question about the new Axiom Plus, which we actually just wrote about on our website. Mm -hmm. He said, Jeff, any thoughts? Are they doing away with the knob and joystick? Yeah, I haven't heard. That's a good question. Um, I haven't heard about that. Um, I don't know. So I'm not privy to what the R&Ds are doing. I don't know. I certainly, I mean, aside from the Axiom, I have to say one of the things that I really liked about, and Simrad did the same thing, B&G as well, uh, and Axiom too, is this whole, and Raymarine were the first, to their credit, I have to give the credit. Uh, they were the first to do both touch and buttons on one device. They call that hybrid uh, back in the day. And that can be useful for some of us. Uh, if you're in a place where, you know, it's not a great area, your hands can be wet, it can be relatively cold, it's bouncing around, there can be an argument to actually have a device that has both touch and buttons. That being said, what Garmin did to solve this problem is they have what are called grids. So on boats, for example, we do a lot of search and rescue boats. And search and rescue are going to be out in big seas. And it's hard to interface a touch screen when you're in big chop or you're taking air and you're trying to go save someone. So the best way to do that is to both interface the device, the display, via touch when things are calm, and also via a grid, uh, which is sort of a little sort of device beside it that you, it's like a mouse, but a mouse that's effectively, and it's not a mouse, but kind of, it's an input device that allows you to control a touch screen via buttons. So don't know the answer about what the future holds, but there is an argument to have both, and Raymarine, to their credit, was the first one to pull it off. So, yeah. All right, I'm going to give a little shout out, shout out here to Mark. He just went online to our merchandise store and bought a hoodie. Hey. So thank you for supporting us. Yeah, thanks, That's guys. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Seahorse, well, that's a good handle. Uh, Seahorse asks, how do I choose the right size circuit breaker? Oh, good one. I know it's geeky, eh? You know, but, eh, hey, that sounds Canadian. <laughs> uh, but sizing a circuit breaker or fuse is essential. Uh, it's super important and not to be sort of just, oh, well, whatever. No, when you're sizing a circuit breaker, you're doing two things. You're sizing it to make sure that you're protecting the wire connected to an appliance, right, a load. And you also want to make sure that you, in most cases, that that appliance also is going to have not a more amperage than it's rated to handle. So, for example, a windless is a prime example. Windless manufacturers are going to tell us, I want you to install a 80 amp circuit breaker, thermal circuit breaker for this windless. So now you need to make sure that the wiring can handle 80 amps. So you should, absolutely. So the wiring has to handle 80 amps. And then the manufacturer told you that the windless can, should not exceed and you should have a thermal circuit breaker for 80 amps. So same thing could happen for any other circuit. You know, so you can buy circuit breakers in increments of 5, 10, 15, 20. Not sure about 25, 30, 40, 50. So when you have a load that is smaller, and let's say a, an appliance says, I want a fuse of only eight amps. Like that's it, that load. Well, what you might do is put a circuit breaker for 10 that protects the wire, and then you're going to have a fuse near the appliance that protects the appliance for eight. So that's how you're going to make sure. You're, gonna, you're basically, you're, when you're putting circuit breakers, you're doing it for two reasons. You're doing it to protect the wire for sure. And then potentially also protect the load. And if the load has a more specific requirement, it says, I want a fast blow 7-amp fuse, then you're going to have a 10-amp circuit breaker and a 7-amp fuse on the same circuit. And what you would do is put the 7-amp fuse near the appliance. So if it doesn't work and someone's pulling off the equipment, they're going to be able to see a blown fuse. And the circuit breaker would be able to protect the line all the way to that fuse on the circuit. So that's how you go about doing that. All right, we have a question from William. He says, I saw an AC Delco 2500 watt inverter installed in a gasoline powered engine room. I understand there's no ignition protection inverter on the market. Is this true? I was told that Masterville did one, and that was about a year ago. And it was when we tried to buy one, it wasn't available. So it's possible that Masterville has one, possible. Uh, and maybe some of you can chime in on that. At last time, it was promised, but it did not pan out. It was a sort of a misprint. Now, they might have changed their tune, don't know, uh, but generally, and I'm talking 99%, like Magnum, like the Victron ones, the Xantrex ones, uh, inverters, large part, I've never seen one yet, it's possible, I've never seen an ignition-protected inverter charger. So you should not, 
unless you have something written in black and white, and I don't even need the box, I want it to be in the manual, send an email to the manufacturer saying, hey, I'm about to install something in a gasoline engine room, right? And this is trigger alarm bells, right? I'm about to install a bomb in an engine room. Do you think it's a concern? Because, I mean, let's be honest, most of us are voting for recreational purposes, and it would be pretty sad to have an accident happen for something as short-sighted as installing a a non-ignition protected device in a gasoline engine room. So yeah, I have I have yet to see it. Maybe it's doable. Again, if anyone has seen it, please share down below your comments. I will research it and look into it. But as of yet, I haven't seen it, no. This is fun. We have a lot of comments. They love your analogies and your metaphors. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I got that from my mom because my mom is French and my dad spoke mostly English and I had to constantly translate between the two languages growing up. We grew up in a bilingual family, so this is where I'm used to translate all the time. Well, and I think your mom's online today. Yeah, she is. Chat? Yeah, she is. She's <laughs> awesome. Shout out. Yeah, shout out to mom and dad. <laughs> Uh, another question here from Jonathan, uh, a recommendation again. What bilge switch do you find the most reliable? Pressure-based versus electronic contacts? Mm. I, it's not a topic. We don't, re it's hard. I've Again, I'm more an, an amateur on this one. Um, Water Witch is a good one. I think that's what it is. Um, Generally, all those are already installed. So we don't, it's not, it's pretty rare that people come to us and say, I'm looking at a new build system. Can you redesign a new one for me? Most of the case, it's bilge pump has failed, replace it. Float has failed, replace it. So that's not something I feel really comfortable. I haven't researched it that much, uh, meaning almost none. It's not a common problem that we encounter. I know that certainly float switch, there are some that I think are mercury that are very unreliable and they do fail. Like on my boat, I have spare float switches for all my bilge pumps um, because I know that they're gonna fail. And it's part of my routine to check every month, I literally go and I lift the floats on all my bilge pump to see if they're actually activating the pump automatically, yeah. All right, so we have a question from the UK. What is your opinion on fusing electrical accessories, lights, which are supplied with small gauge fixed leads, i.e. 30, but fed from 15? Mm. Yeah, you should, every wire on a boat needs to be fused, 100%. You know, a match could start, you know, an inferno. So you, fire is one of those things. An overloaded circuit is an overloaded circuit. Every circuit has a maximum amperage that can go through. And if you exceed that, for whatever reason, a dead short, that wire is going to get insanely hot. And before it melts away, it's also probably going to melt its insulation jacket. And when it does that, if there are other wires in that bundle, then you're going to have a domino effect. The other wires in the bundle will also have their jacket melted. They're also going to short, which is going to cause more heat, which is going to cause the whole bundle to just, it's like an avalanche, you know. And it literally is a snowball. You see these bundles that are completely crisp. And so every single wire on a boat has to be fused and you would fuse it at the start of the circuit. And I know that means maybe a tiny fuse, a one amp fuse, that's fine. A two amp fuse, that's okay. But every single circuit has to be fused. It doesn't take much to start a fire. And remember on a boat, and this is, this is by the way, right? Most of us are boating for recreational purposes. And when we're on the boat, there's not a lot of exits. Sometimes we're on the water. The water is maybe too cold or maybe we're so far away from shore. We can't just jump in the water and be saved. Once you're in the water, you're, the ordeal is not over, right? You might be alone. It might be in the dark. You might be away from shore. What are you going to do? So the best approach is prevention, prevention, prevention. And in our homes, um, both commercial buildings, residential, all of them, every single wire, everything on land, certainly in Canada, North America, in most jurisdictions in the world, of course, it depends, some countries aren't there yet, will have every single wire fused. Every single wire, no matter how small, it has to be fused. Before we get to our next fusing question, a little shout out to Spence who is online because his dad works in the office with us. So morning, Spence. Hey, Spence, good morning, <laughs> that's awesome. That's so cool. Uh, we have another fusing question here. Ephraim, 
Should I be fusing my AC appliances? Why or why not? Yeah, so for AC, it's actually easy. Uh, it, they're circuit breakers. So um, AC appliances don't have very specific, like the like like DC. Like I was saying, some loads want three, two point five amps, four amp fuse, seven amp fuse. It's extremely specific. With AC, it's five amp breaker, ten amp breaker, fifteen amp breaker, twenty amp breaker, because realistically, you're only wiring. Basically, either you know, 14.3, 12.3, 14.3 is 15-amp, 12.3 is 10-amp, uh, 10.3 is 30-amp, and then maybe you're going to do 8.3, which is 50-amp. And 12.3, by the way, is 20-amp. So all of those are different wire gauges in North America for different amperage size for AC. So effectively, we are protecting the circuit, which that's the purpose of a fuse, we're protecting the circuit with a circuit breaker at the beginning of the circuit. And it protects not only the wire, but also the appliance. So that's how you solve that problem. Like in our homes, you know, there's a sort of this panel somewhere hidden behind a door, behind a picture frame, you open it up and there's all these circuit breakers and they all have different sizes. Those are effectively acting as fuses. That's what they're there for. They're thermal circuit breakers that can act as a switch and can be easily reset. All right. Well, we are coming up on an hour now. Um, oh, wow. It goes so quickly, doesn't it? It's amazing. Uh, I hope you've learned a lot. Uh, a gentleman here, oh, early from San Francisco, wants to know if you've written a book, Dummies, on the subject. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a great question. I think my book is going to be a video book. Um, we're probably going to do something, but I'm a real big fan of this medium. I think you need to be extremely talented in life to be able to convey all of this just with words. Intonation, my hands moving, the tone of my voice. It's a different medium and I don't, it's pretty hard to be able to explain all of that just with words without the emotion. And so maybe one day I'll write a book, potentially, but right now I'm more focusing on doing this content as it seems to be resonating with more of us uh, than the written word. Mine might be too boring. I'm not that good, I don't think. Well, I will say there's lots of questions that haven't been answered. So Sorry. Uh, we're going to write them all down. And Jeff's going to turn some of them into videos. So look for those over the next few weeks. We really do enjoy doing these. Um, thank you for joining us. And uh, I'll let Jeff say, sign us out. Yeah, thanks, everyone, for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's super energizing. I could do this for 10 hours. Maybe one day we'll do a marathon run. This is this to me is paradise. Thank you for uh, the uh, the opportunity of being here with all of you and uh, happy boating and safe boating. Take care. Ciao. Bye bye.